today is that I work with a, a subsidiary ministry of Power to Change students called Ultimate Questions. And what we seek to do at Ultimate Questions is we seek to answer those, those curious questions that we have with credible answers in order to ultimately point to the one who is the ultimate answer, that being Jesus Christ. Um, so what I want to talk with you about today is how do we go about conversations with friends, with family, with uh, our fellow students, with uh, teammates, in order to navigate spiritual conversations. Because that's not always an easy thing to do. In fact, sometimes it's a really hard thing to do. Sometimes it, it looks like this. Morning, Jim. Robert. Hey. Hi, Jim. Free kiss. Sometimes it's awkward. Sometimes we have these conversations and they don't always go the way we initially planned them to go. Kind of like the lights right now. Front row. So the question is, how do we take what we believe and answer questions in regards to why we believe it? How do we share the gospel with the people around us? Well, um, I mentioned uh, a word earlier in terms of what we do at Ultimate Questions, and that word, word was apologetics. Now, that may be a word you've heard before. It may be a word that you're not all that familiar with. Um, but it's a word that, that comes from the Bible. In uh, 1 Peter 3.15, Peter writes to the dispersed church in the ancient world, and he says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to, for the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ will be ashamed of their slander. And there's a little, uh, little phrase there that I've outlined in red that in the language that the Bible was originally written in, in Greek, um, is translated to give an answer. And that's the phrase pros apologian. And what we do in English is we take the beginning of that, that Greek word, apologia, which means to give an answer, to give a defense, to give a reason. We take the beginning of it and we stick an English suffix on the end and we develop the field and study of what we now call apologetics, giving answers for what we believe, giving reasons to others in terms of that hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Um, the field and study of apologetics, uh, although it's been developed throughout history by Christians, uh, it, there, are, there are other individuals who do apologetics. There are Muslim apologetics. There are Mormon uh, apologists. Uh, and it's just a base level answering the questions of why we, we, what we believe and why we believe them. And sometimes when, when I go around and I talk about apologetics, there's this idea that within the body of Christians, you have you know, your average butt in the pew, who goes to church every Sunday, and then you have these, these little subset of apologists and theologians, you know, these super smart guys who we're glad they know the answers because we're not always sure that we do sometimes. But the fact is, the Bible talks about the subject of your faith in a way that really merits us, everyone, being apologists. And Peter wasn't writing to me where my job title is an apologist. They didn't exist. He was writing to average Christians in the church in the ancient world. My, my friend, uh, Andy Bannister, who's a Christian evangelist and apologist, he says, for any Christian, when someone says to you, why are you a Christian? What you're going to respond with is an apologetic. Everyone has an apologetic. It's either a good one or a bad one. Even something just as simple as, why Jesus? That's an apologetic question. And it's an apologetic question that I think we should at least on a certain level be able to answer. So being an apologist comes down to our ability to have spiritual conversations, as I said before, with those around us. 
Uh, for instance, here's an example of how to not have a spiritual conversation. I'm a little concerned right now about your salvation and stuff. How come you have not been baptized? Because I never got around to it, okay? I don't know why you always have to be judging me. Because I only believe in science. But tonight, we are going up against Satan's caveman. And I just thought it would be a good idea if you... <laughs> That's not a good idea. It's not how you have good spiritual conversations. Now, what I want to share with you is I want to go through a few tools, a few tactics that uh, I think are I found useful in terms of my conversations just on a, on a regular level, um, but are things that you can practically put into practice when talking with uh, people around you who, who maybe have no experience, no um, exposure to Christianity at all. And really what, what I'm calling these are the three facts of evangelistic apologetics. And what I, where I've drawn these from is specifically from that 1 Peter 3.15 passage. Um, the first one being knowledge, an informed mind. Every Christian should have a basic knowledge, a founding framework of facts to work from. So this is studying, this is reading the Bible, this is getting together with other Christians and just talking about your faith and figuring out the details. And that's the, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared aspect of that verse. The second is what I call wisdom, artful persuasion. Now, this is our method. This is communicating the knowledge effectively and persuasively. What Peter calls to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And finally, character, uh, an attractive manner. And every Christian needs to understand that without character, all the knowledge and all the wisdom often falls on deaf ears. And you can know all the right answers, and it's easy to win an argument, but it's a lot easier to win a soul. And if you tear someone's nose off and then hand them a rose, it doesn't really help them at all. Really, the idea is what, what I call putting a stone in someone's shoe. Now, all you need to do is put the stone in someone's shoe. Now, We've all had stones in our shoes, right? And just walking around, it's even more annoying in a workout. It irritates you. It's annoying, and especially if, say, you're running, you don't want to stop and get it out. So you're trying to kick it around. It's annoying. Now, sometimes when we engage in conversations about our faith, we seem to think that we need to hit a home run in the conversation. But we don't need to hit a home run. In fact, you don't even need to get to home base. All you have to do most of the time is just step up to the plate. You just have to be there in the conversation, and often that goes a long way. So how do we bridge the content that we learn when we do things like Bible studies, when we get together with other Christians and try to hammer out some of these issues regarding our faith and other people's faith and that worldview stuff? How do we bridge all the content and get to the conversation? How do we go from the scholarship, the information, to the relationship and actually practically applying it to people? Because sometimes we enter into conversations and, and we see people saying things like this. You know, Christians are irrational. Christians are intolerant. Christians are anti-sex and anti-science and anti-intellectual and anti-women. Evolution has disproven Christianity. The Bible isn't true. God doesn't exist. You know, when I used to get into conversations where people would throw those sorts of things out, I used to think that I needed to be able to answer everything. That it was my job as a representative of Christ to be that Christian encyclopedia, to be the Bible answer man. And if that's your attitude, you find it pretty quickly that you're probably going to fail. Now, I used to jump into an argument mode, but the problem was I fell right into the trap of what the people wanted to begin with. See, when people throw these sorts of accusations out, they often say them, and then they step back and say, okay, Christian, I'm waiting. 
But the problem is, it's not your job to answer their claims. It's your job to hold them to account for the claims that they just made. Here's a standard rule. They made the claim, not you, so whoever makes the claim bears the burden of proof. Now, don't let yourself get thrust into defensive positions when you're not the one making the claim. You know, a practical way to go about this is to simply ask a question back. Something like, like this. What do you mean by that? So, let me give you an example. All religions are basically the same. Okay, well, what do you mean by all religions? What do you mean by basically the same? I mean, religions don't claim to be basically the same, so what do you mean when you say that? That helps clarify what they mean. That's a variation of the what do you mean by that question. Or, how about this one? It's irrational to believe in God. I actually had someone tell me this the other day. They said, yeah, but it's irrational to believe in God. So I said, well, what do you mean by irrational? What do you mean by rationality? Where are you getting that from? And what do you mean by God? Because sometimes when you ask that question, you find out that the God they're talking about isn't even the God you believe in. I mean, the famous atheist Richard Dawkins says that he doesn't believe in a God who is homophobic and who's homicidal and who's genocidal and who's a megalomaniac. And I say, great, me neither. The God Richard Dawkins doesn't believe in, I don't believe in either. So when we ask, what do you mean by God, what we flesh out is what the conversation is exactly about. Because sometimes the God they think is irrational to believe in isn't the God you believe in. In fact, I would argue, it's not the God you believe in. Or what about this one? I can't believe in a God who allows evil things to happen. What about the recent school shooting? What about some of the things that are happening globally? I can't believe in a God that would allow so many bad things to happen. What do you mean by bad? What do you mean by evil? Now, where are you getting those ideas? If there is no God, then what are you grounding evil in? I mean, you, you can say, I don't like when evil things happen, but to say, to make the, the, their ought statement, there ought not to be evil in the world, means that there's some objective good as a counterexample to your objective evil. But if there's no God, there's no objective good. So there's no objective evil. What do you mean by evil? Tim Muehlhoff from Biola University says, people tend to only trade conclusions, not how different parties arrive at their conclusions. And often when you get into conversations and you let the other person yeah. put you on the offense. You don't realize that that's not really the place you need to be. You see, it's all this idea of how do we build arguments? Because what a lot of people do is they just throw out an assertion. It's kind of like the roof of a house. Now, when was the last time you saw someone building a house start, who started with the roof? Nobody, right? It's not how you build a house, but that's what people do. They throw the assertion out. Well, it's irrational to believe in God. And then they step back and expect you to defend the claim that they've already made. But that's not how arguments are made. The building, the scaffolding that holds up the building is the rationale. You can't just throw an, assert an assertion without an argument behind it, without evidence behind it. But that's what a lot of people do. And we fall into their trap by allowing them to do it. By going on the defense and trying to answer every time they throw out these sort of assertions. Now, it's, it's interesting to look at how Jesus answers questions in the Bible, because this is almost a pattern of how we should deal with people, right? There's uh, an interesting story in Luke 20 and a parallel in, in Matthew 22. Now, I'll, I'll just read it quickly for you, but I'm sure if you're, you're familiar um, with the Gospels, you're probably familiar with this story. It says, then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap Jesus in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God, and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give tax to Caesar or not? Now, there's a number of clues in this story. 
And one of them is that it's a trap. And we know that because it says they wish to trap him. That's one of those little clues when you're doing Bible study and you to figure out what's going on. And if you'll notice in the story, the Pharisees aren't even there. Because this question is so politically hot, they don't even want to be there. So they send their disciples, they go to the Starbucks around the corner, so that if things heat up, they can say, well, we weren't there. We didn't know what's going on. And to us, this seems like a simple question. But the problem is, it's a very political question. You see, in the context of Jesus' day, the nation of Israel was being oppressed by the Romans. <clears throat> and paying taxes was a symbol of funding the oppression of the Jewish people who are under Roman rule. So when they say, should we pay taxes, the question is not actually about taxes. It's about moral compromise. Because if Jesus says yes, he's effectively saying, we should fund the oppression of God's people. But if he says no, well, he's breaking the law, and the Herodians, who are actually the cops who came along, they're there, so they'll arrest Jesus and take him away. It's a trap. But Jesus does something very clever. He redefines the question. So he's been asked one question and he answers another. Jesus knows that it's okay to pay tax when it's appropriate to pay tax. But that's not the real question. The real question is what we give to God. So he asks for a coin and he says, whose image is on this? And they say Caesar. And he says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. Now, it's interesting, they didn't ask what belongs to God. Because I think Jesus could have very well pointed at them and said, whose image is on you? But the, the trick is that Jesus doesn't let himself get into their trap. You see, the right answer to the wrong question is still the wrong answer. Now, let me give you an example of this. When we came back from overseas, I was around the age of 10. And I played this game where I would go around the schoolyard and I would say to my fellow uh, students, I would say, can I ask you a yes or no question? And then I would say, does your mom know you're stupid? <laughs> now, this is a trap question, because if they say yes, it means they're stupid and their mom knows it. If they say no, it still means they're stupid, their mom just doesn't know. And if they say, I don't know, then they're too stupid to understand the question. <laughs> this is a trap. The right answer is still the wrong answer because it's the wrong question. But the problem is, with a lot of conversations we get into, the question is wrong. And so sometimes we give the right answer, but because it's a trap, we fall into a wrong situation. It's interesting to see when Jesus is asked a question, he answers the question 183 times. But he answers a question with a question 307 times. So when Jesus is interacting with people, he's actually as asking more questions than he is answering questions. The theologian and philosopher Francis Schaeffer says, if I have only an hour with someone, I will spend the first 55 minutes asking questions and finding out what is troubling their heart and mind. And then for the last five minutes, I'll share something of the truth. Now this is the complete opposite of what I want to do. I want to spend 55 minutes telling them what's true and then say, do you have any questions? We have five minutes left. <laughs> the problem is that often doesn't get us very far. You see, when we probe with qualifying questions, like the question, what do you mean by that? It has some benefits. It immediately engages the person in the conversation. It also shows genuine interest in that person. It forces that person to think about what they've actually said. If you do this, you'll find out pretty quick that a lot of people have no idea what they mean by that. No possible idea. They've heard it from somewhere, or they've read it, and they're just parroting it. When someone says it's irrational to believe in God, oh, don't drop your water bottle. <laughs> when someone says it's irrational to believe in God, and you say, what do you mean by rationality? They have no idea what they mean by rationality, most of the time. That's what you'll find out. It also allows you to proceed knowledgeably, because if they do know what they're talking about, then you're moving forward on a basis of knowledge, of understanding where they're coming from. But that only goes so far. The follow-up question to what do you mean by that, or a version of it, is how did you come by that conclusion? You need to figure out how they developed that frame of thought. 
Now, just like if you ask them what do you mean by that question, and you find out they have no idea what they mean by that, sometimes you'll ask the how did you come by that conclusion, and they'll have no idea how they came by that conclusion. And even worse, you'll find out that they didn't even come to the conclusion. Someone else did, and like I said before, they're just repeating it. That's often what we do. I mean, I'm guilty of this. Christians are guilty of this. We far too often just parrot what we think sounds clever or sounds smart or what we even think is the right answer. After you flesh that out, then you can go into, have you ever thought about it? You know, what do you mean by that? Someone says to me, you know, well, the Gospels, the Bible, that's just full of contradictions. Well, what do you mean by a contradiction? Can you show me an example of a contradiction? Well, a lot of the time, they, they don't. They can't. They've just heard it. Well, how did you come by that conclusion? Oh, well, someone told me. Sometimes they'll have read the Bible, but a lot of times they haven't. So let's say, have you ever thought about the fact that all of these supposed contradictions are really just differentiation of details, not contradictions? You know, whether there was one person who was at Jesus' tomb at the resurrection, or three, that's not a contradiction. That's a differentiation in details. You can still have three women, and John only tells you about one. That's not a contradiction. It doesn't say, there were only three women who went to the tomb, nobody else went to the tomb. And then John says, there was only one woman who went to the tomb. No, that's not what it's saying. That's not a contradiction. Now, guys in the room, if you have a significant other, don't do this in a conversation. <laughs> I've been married two years, I've tried it, it doesn't work out well. My wife knows exactly what she means by that, and she knows exactly how she came to that conclusion. So just a word to the wise, don't use that. <laughs> You see, if I circle back to the knowledge aspect of those three facts of apologetic evangelism, um, to illustrate the point, I want to tell you a little bit of a story. When I was younger, I said my family came back from overseas, but even then my, my dad was a pastor and we traveled around quite a bit. And uh, when I was around the age of 13, we moved from Ontario to BC. And my dad, my grandfather, and I drove across the country with a U-Haul trailer. And then my, my mom and my siblings flew later in the week. And as we drove past, specifically, the long um, fields in Saskatchewan, I noticed certain things that stood out to me. Things like trees in the middle of a field. The field was completely open, and yet sometimes there would be giant trees. And the trees were exposed to the elements. And I remember thinking, what was it that made those trees last so long? How did they survive the storms and being open to the wind and the rain and the sun? And the answer is that there was a lot that I didn't see. What was sustaining the tree was everything below the ground. What's going on in the root system? Now, similarly, as Christians living in a society, we need strong, deep intellectual and spiritual roots. And the, wind, the winds, rather, and the rains of skepticism and spiritual darkness are hard, and they can really take a toll on us, both directly and indirectly. And if we're honest, how many of us are totally, totally comfortable with people confronting us about what we believe? A lot of the time, that's not something that's all that easy to deal with. It can be scary. Our roots might be there, but they're not running deep. They're not strong. And far too many followers of Christ feel unprepared in their faith to be placed in the interrogator's box. Being unprepared being the key ingredient to fear. And if we're afraid, we're far less likely to enter, voluntarily or otherwise, into conversations regarding our faith. And many of us don't even realize the vast depository of theological and historical and scientific and philosophical information that lies behind the Christian faith to begin with. And many simply don't know that there are credible and capable and concrete answers to those ultimate questions and objections raised against the Christian faith. And really it's far too late for the tree to start thinking about growing its root system when it's in the middle of the storm. That all takes place earlier. That all takes place in the growing process. Because at the end of the day, 
we do have a little bit of homework. Apart from asking questions, we really need to answer, why do I believe what I believe? And what do I believe about what I believe? Those are important questions. Why do I claim to be a Christian? And what does that mean for me? What has that meant historically for other people who have called themselves Christians? It's not always an easy answer. Now, let me just quickly finish with this. Because sometimes conversations go south. Sometimes it doesn't always work cordially when you're talking about your faith with others. And here are my two pieces of advice. Advice. If you're drowning, tell them you don't know. It's okay to answer with saying, I, I don't know, but I'll look into it and I'll get back to you. Humility is a good thing. <clears throat> and especially if you're in an interaction with someone who clearly knows more about a certain topic than you do. I was on a, a train ride um, going to Montreal a few months back, and the guy sitting beside me I got into a conversation with ended up being a professor in astrophysics. Now, I have no idea anything to do with astrophysics. And so when I engage in a conversation about faith, and he starts throwing astrophysics at me, I am grossly unprepared. So at that point, I say, you know what, that's interesting. I'll look into that. I'd just like to pick your brain. What do you think about this? And I got a free lesson in astrophysics. <laughs> But it's okay to admit that sometimes we don't know all the answers because we're never always going to know all the answers. The other thing is, if conversations get heated, what I like to do is I like to slow the conversation down and just simply say, can I ask you a question? If Christianity were true, would you believe it? It's a hypothetical. It doesn't mean Christianity is true. But if it was true, would you believe it? Now, sometimes I'm surprised, maybe I shouldn't be, with people who say no. Even if it was true, I wouldn't believe it. But what that does is it allows you to proceed in the conversation. Because at that point, it doesn't really matter what you say. They're not interested in the truth. But if they do say, yes, if Christianity were true, I would believe it. Then you can work off of that in order to say, well, would you read a book if I gave it to you? Would you read a pamphlet if I gave it to you? Would you be willing to meet with myself or someone else and talk about that a little bit. Then you can proceed knowledgeably. You know, there's another one of these verses in the Bible that talks about what we would traditionally call apologetics. It's written not by Peter, but by Paul. And he writes to the church in Colossae, and what we have is Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. And he says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Notice he says everyone. He doesn't say every question. He says, so that you may know how to answer everyone. We're answering people. We're not answering questions. There's a questioner behind the question. But he uses this imagery of salt, which I find really interesting. Because salt has a number of qualities. It preserves. When you put salt on, say, meat, it preserves the meat. In fact, before the invention of refrigeration, they used salt quite a bit to preserve food items. It also purifies. It's an, it has antiseptic qualities. If you pour salt in a wound, it will work to heal that wound. And it seasons. This is why we put salt on our food. It also changes the environment. What happens when you put salt on ice? We had a pretty brutal winter that hopefully is over. We used a lot of salt, right? It changes the environment around it. And finally, salt irritates. If you put salt in a wound, it's going to clean it, it's going to purify it, but it's going to be uncomfortable. And sometimes we have spiritual conversations that end up being a little bit uncomfortable. Now, if you're only being uncomfortable, if you're only irritating people, you're probably not being salt in the right way. But I think there's a little aspect of each of these that helps us to understand the question, that helps us to interact with people on a certain level, to be wise in the way we act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity so that our conversations will always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that we may know how to answer everyone. And as Paul says, in our hearts revere Christ as Lord, always being prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have, but doing so with gentleness and respect, 
keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak malici maliciously against our good behavior in Christ will be ashamed of their slander.